So Psalm 51, uh, if you've been joining along with us in our Bible reading plan during the course of this week, you will know that it has been an action-packed week uh, for King David in his story and, and so on. And we're going to be digging into a bit of it. The, this psalm finds its context in one Samuel, uh, sorry, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, but I'll unpack it a little bit um, as we go along in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, but Psalm 51, it has, uh, says the following. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin are always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin. And blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. It's God's word to us this morning, and it all flows out of a very severe, revealing statement from the prophet Nathan to his king David when he looks at him and he says, you are the man. I imagine that there wouldn't have been, uh, would have been a certain amount. It's got an exclamation mark in, in, in 1 Samuel 12. You are the man. And I, I would imagine that David, Nathan is pointing at David at this point, and he's saying to him, you, you are the man. A few simple little words, but they've a few simple little words that seem to land like a hammer blow on David's life and just shatter all of his righteous indignation. Uh, it breaks open the doors of the closet in which he has carefully hidden all the different skeletons that he's got. He's sort of stacked them all up neatly inside there of the, the different sins that he's committed over the previous few months. They're all neatly packed away, but, but Nathan's words saying, you are the man. Bring them all tumbling out into, into the open. And my guess is that when, when Nathan went and confronted King David about his sin, my guess is that maybe, just maybe, David was thinking to himself, I got away with it. I got away with it. There's a few people that know in the palace, for sure, and, and Joab, he's not stupid. He can put two and two together. But you know what? Nobody's going to challenge me. I think I've gotten away with it. What started off as something very, very small, which spiraled out of control and ended up with David having this, skeleton, this closet full of skeletons. I thought, maybe I got away with it. But the words, you are the man, bring it all tumbling out. And it, it did start small, right? If you're familiar with the story you know that it starts small. In the beginning of one, 2 Samuel chapter 11, it was the spring at the time when kings go to war. Only King David doesn't. So immediately the alarm bells are ringing in our mind. We're thinking, well, he's not where he's supposed to be. Right? He's not gone to the front line to battle, to stand shoulder to shoulder with his mighty men, pressing into the presence of God because he's constantly putting his life on the line seeking God earnestly in prayer. He's not there. Instead, he's in, in the palace. And so it just so happens that one day as he's in the palace, he decides to take a walk on the roof of the palace. And as he's taking 
a walk on the roof of the palace, he just so happens to see a woman further down who's, who's bathing. And the narrator gives us a bit of detail. The narrator tells us that she was incredibly beautiful. In the same way that the narrator told us that Abigail, one of David's wives, was incredibly beautiful and also intelligent. And David sees her and he sends a message to go and find out who she is. And the messenger comes back and it's, it's Bathsheba. She's married to one of your mighty men whose name is Uriah the Hittite. Somebody you fought shoulder to shoulder with. Somebody you've told campfire stories around the fire with. Somebody you've, you've taught songs. In other words, he's your friend, right? But none of this seems to register on David at all because he's king. And I think he's getting used to king. And maybe a little bit of the power that he has as king is going to his head a little bit. And so all the power words that follow in David's actions, they're all there hidden within the text. There's lots of sending and taking that all of a sudden takes place. He sends a messenger to go and take Bathsheba from her home to his home. And then he takes her to bed. And when he's finished, he sends her back out again. Maybe thinking to himself, well, that's it, right? I've had my fun and I'm, I'm done now. She can go and nobody need know anything about this. Only Bathsheba sends him words, uh, a word a few weeks later, I'm pregnant. And David is totally unperturbed. Because he sends a message to the front line where Uri the Hittite is fighting to his commander-in-chief Job. And he says, send to me Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah arrives and so he decides, oh, do you know what? I'm going to send Uriah back to his house. Because, I mean, he's going to do what, what, what any husband would do, right? He's going to go home. He's going to take a shower. He's going to have date night with his wife and spend a little bit of quality time, you know. But David didn't bank on the fact that Uriah was an honorable man, far more honorable than what David had been. And so Uriah's like, are you crazy? <laughs> my master Job is fighting the battles on the front line, and you want me to go home and spend some quality time with my wife? You've you got to be kidding. No, I'm going to sleep at the gate. David thinks, well, that doesn't work, so I'll ply him with a little bit of alcohol the following evening, and then that will break down his inhibitions. Surely he's going to go home then, but he's like, no, no, I'm not doing it. And so David's still unperturbed, and he takes control of the situation and as Uriah the Hittite goes back to the front lines two days later, David sends with him a messenger to Joab, giving Joab the orders, make sure that you send Uriah the Hittite to where the fighting is the fiercest. And when the fighting is the fiercest, make sure you take away the support around him so that his life gets taken. And Joab follows his orders to a T, and he does exactly that. And Uriah the Hittite is struck down dead. And David has succeeded in taking Uriah the Hittite's life, and then he proceeds to take Uriah the Hittite's wife. And he's probably thinking, this is okay, because I'm king, and I'm in control, and I'm a little bit like God, only he's not. God is king. God is in control. God is alone, is God, and there is no other, and God is none pleased with the things that David has done. And so what started with a lustful whim in the space of a single chapter, it just spirals out of control into this sex and murder scandal. Something that started really, really small, and that it, gradually and unobtrusively, and that, that's the nature of sin, isn't it? It, it often starts off in our lives as something really small, something really unobtrusive. It was the spring when kings were supposed to go to war, only David doesn't. And, and there's the starting place of things beginning to go wrong. And, and, and sin will start really unobtrusively and really small, and it's going to promise you the world and then hide the price tag at the same time. You ever notice that? Sin says that you can have everything. You know, it's all going to be yours, but the price tag is hidden. My guess is that if David knew what it would cost him, this moment's titillation, because he's seen an attractive woman bathing on a roof, there's this moment's titillation. If he had known the price that he would have to pay in the end, my guess is that he would have run for the hills, right? He would have absolutely run for the hills, but he doesn't, and so there's a price to be paid. Maybe some of you know what that feels like, right? 
sin with all of its temptation came along and you're like, you're first you're like, no, 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 but it's promising the world. And so you say, oh, what, you know what, it's not going to hurt anybody. I'm doing it in private. It's okay. And that sort of thing. And then three months later, six months later, nine months later, you're like, I never knew it was going to cost me so much. I never knew it was going to wreak such havoc in my life. I never knew it was this, doing this small little thing that I thought nobody would know about has affected so many other people around me as well. It's a great New Testament promise. I don't know if you, you're familiar with it. It's in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 where, where Paul's writing to the church and he's, he's warning them about temptation, the temptation to sin. He's, he's saying to them, listen, be vigilant. Don't let your guard down. Right? Make sure that you stay vigilant. And, and, and here's, here's some good news for you. God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure. And then he will always provide a way out for you. So if you imagine it like this, that sin is a highway. There's a song like that, isn't it? If life was a highway, I'm going to ride it all night long. Do you know the one? Ish. Okay. Well, just imagine if sin was a highway, you know, I'm going to ride it all night long. That's a choice. You know what God's going to do? He's going to provide off-ramps for you at every interval that you can take to move away from temptation, to move away from sin. David had all these different off-ramps that he could have taken. It was the spring when kings went to war. As he was walking on the roof, bored, he could have said, you know what, pack my kit bag, I'm going to go fight. Once he had seen Bathsheba, he could have decided, you know what, pack my kit bag, I'm going to go fight. He could have said, uh, tell one of my wives or concubines, we're, we're going to have date night tonight. After he had sinned and committed adultery and he got the word that Bathsheba was pregnant, he could have sent a message to Uriah the Hittite saying, listen, we need to talk, I've messed up. You know, there were all these different avenues that David could have taken off the off-ramp, off the highway of sin, but he, he chooses not to because, like I said, he's, he's in control, right? He's playing God. He's king, only he's not. He's not in control. God is king, and God's not pleased. And so he sends his prophet Nathan to come and confront David, and Nathan's words to David, it comes in the form of a parable. It's really worthwhile reading in, in 2 Samuel 12, and David listens, and he gets drawn into Nathan's story, and then eventually those words come, hey, David, you're the man. You're the one that's behaved in this way. You're the one that is guilty, and all of a sudden, everything comes tumbling out. It's a busted moment. You ever been in a busted moment where you've done something wrong, and you think that you've gotten away with it, you think you've covered it up, but all of a sudden, everything's brought out into the light, and you're like, duh, busted. I remember more than one occasion like this growing up as a child and being caught by my mom who's sitting here this morning. Busted! I was just like, oh, man. Oh, I should have been more careful. I should have been more clever, you know. Uh, it's a busted moment, but it's a beautiful moment. It's a God moment. It's a moment of encounter. It's a moment that, that opens up the possibility for change. But it all, it all depends on how we respond. You know, as Nathan's pointing at David, you are the man. It all depends what David does next. And he could have responded in a whole lot of different ways. He could have, he could have denied, which is something that we do when we get caught, right? He could have denied, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't done anything wrong. Did I do something wrong? I, I don't know what you're talking about. It must have been somebody else who's got the same name and kind of looks like me. I think they're the ones <laughs> that are to blame. Or maybe we blame right? This is something people do as well, right? We blame. It's not my fault. It's actually her fault. I mean, here I, I'm just walking around on my real estate on my roof. This could be David sort of thinking like this. When I happen to get to the edge of the roof and peer around the corner, and I just so happen to see a woman bathing there, it's not my fault. She's at fault. She should have, you know, been a little bit more appropriate and covered up and et cetera, et cetera. It's not me. It's her fault. Shifting the blame. Perhaps he could have feigned ignorance. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> I mean, come on, after all, he's Uriah the Hittite. He's a foreigner. doesn't matter how we treat foreigners, right? So we can, we can just treat foreigners however we like to treat them. You know, we, we can take their wives and everything. That, that'll be okay. I, didn't I would never do it to a fellow Israelite, but to a, 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 a foreigner, that, that's okay. We can treat people like that. He could have justified his actions, which is something else that we do. It's not my fault. 
you know. Uh, I've got all these reasons why I am not to blame. And this is so often how people react when they're in a busted moment. But, but David doesn't. You're the man. And David says, I've sinned against the Lord. It's a beautiful moment. It's a beautiful moment in Scripture. It's a beautiful moment in our lives when we come to this realization that our hearts have been wandering away from God and we say to ourselves, you know what, I've, I've sinned against the Lord. And I say it's a beautiful moment because confession connects us to the grace of God. Confession connects us to the mercy of God. And I'm sure you know this, but not all confessions are equal, right? Sometimes people confess sin to other people and they say, I, I, I'm sorry, you know, my bad, won't do that again, and then go and do exactly the same thing all over again five minutes later. That, that's, that's not confession. That's not confession that's really touched the heart. David's confession is doing something deep in his heart. And that great phrase in 2 Samuel 12 where he says, I have sinned against the Lord. It's almost as if Psalm 51 is the commentary on that single verse. Psalm 51 is the, the commentary that unpacks that verse and says, I've sinned against the Lord, and, and, and this is what it looks like inside my heart. This is what's going on inside my heart as I confess my sin to God. And I think in David recording this prayer for us, I'm so grateful that he did, because in David recording this prayer for us, he shows us four things about true godly confession. You want to confess sin in such a way that it will train, change the shape of your heart, change the, transform your life. Well, then here's what it looks like. There's a realizing, there's a pleading, there's an expecting, and there's a promising. Four simple things that, that, that are contained in Psalm 51. First of all, David realizes that he's sinned. Right? God's Word does its work as it comes to David. It exposes something in his life. And, and, and it, seems, it sounds so simple, but the thing is, unless you realize that you have sinned, you will never be able to turn to God for grace, right? If you're blaming, if you're justifying, if you're accusing other people, you're never going to be able to turn yourself towards God for grace. If we remain indignant, uh, ignorant of sin in our lives or indifferent to sin in our lives, then we will never be able to turn to the God of grace who saves us from our sins. But David's not indifferent and he's not ignorant. And in the first few verses of Psalm 51, it just begins to tumble out. I have transgressed. I have sinned. There is, I've been iniquitous. There is iniquity in my life. I need, I need cleansing. They're, they're words, in a sense, that David uses, simple words that he uses, which are, are, a, are a bucket that just contain his confession. By David saying these things, he's, he's basically saying, I have coveted, I have stolen another man's wife, I have committed adultery, I have conspired to have somebody murdered, and I've succeeded, I have grossly abused my power. It brings out gets brought out into the open. I mean, this is another thing about confession. We need to be focused on what it is that we're confessing. Name, our con name the stuff that it is before God. God, I have been jealous. God, I haven't put a guard over my mouth. God, I've been unkind in my actions, my words. You know, we specifically name the different things before God. This morning in the, in the All Age service, I had a, a couple of pictures up of M Mr. Men and Little Miss characters. Do you know these? Right? We had Mr. Grumpy and Mr. Lazy and Little Miss Naughty and Little Miss Jealous and all these different things up there and we, you know, showing these pictures and stuff. And I, I said to the people, the first congregation, I said, uh, uh, we, we look at these pictures, right? And our first thing is, oh God, thank goodness I'm not as bad as them. The temptation is we look at David and we can say, oh, thank goodness God, I'm not as bad as him. But the moment that we begin to think like that, then we've stumbled at the first hurdle because we're not realizing the sin that is within us. I remember one of the first Alpha courses that I was a part of here at the church, once I was uh, here in ministry. I remember after session two, there was one lady who left. And Betty went out after her to, to go and say, is everything all right? You know, why, why aren't you staying for the, the, the discussion group? And she, she looked at Betty and she said, I, I don't need this. 
And Betty said, what, what do you mean? You don't need this. And she, she said, I, I don't need this. I, I've never done anything wrong. I'm not a bad person. And Betty said, are you sure? And she said, yeah, I'm sure. And she turned away and she walked away. Without the realization of sin, there can be no turning to God. And if there is no turning to God, there can be no repentance. And if there is no repentance, there is no opening ourselves up to the grace of God to come and renew and restore and, and, and heal our hearts. David realizes, he's like, my sin and transgressions, they are forever before me, God. I've, I've transgressed against you. I've, I've sinned against you, God. It's there before me. And so he realizes his sin to begin with, but then he moves very quickly to a pleading with God. And just so we're clear what we're talking about, because when I first thought of the word pleading, I thought pleading means groveling, right? Self-abasement. Making sure that we say sorry enough and in the right kind of way with the right emphasis on the right words, because then God will forgive us. So like things like, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm really, really so sorry. I'm really, really so, 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 so sorry, sorry. You know, by our many words, we're going to be forgiven, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just an emotional appeal. An emotional appeal that, that, that comes from the heart. And as David makes this emotional appeal before God, as he begins to plead with God, you've got to notice that it's both outward and then it's inward. The pleading that he does before God is, is outward. I need you to take something away from me, God. And then it's pleading inward. God, I need you to do something new in me. He prays to God and he says, God, I need you, I need you to blot out and wash out and cleanse me of my sin. They're great words. They're, they're great words. To blot out, that's, that's when you've spilt chicken tikka masala on the, the lounge carpet, right? And you go with scrubbing brush to try and clean it out, but it only makes it worse. You ever been there before? Or something else? And so what do you do? You go to Ikea, and you buy a rug that matches your carpet, and you put it over the stain. For what reason? To blot it out. And eventually, after a period of time, you, you don't remember it anymore. You don't remember it anymore because it, it, it's been blotted out. And David's saying, my, my transgressions, my sin, the adultery, the murder, the conniving, the abuse of power. God, I want you to blot it out so that it's not remembered anymore. God, I want you to wash me. There's something that has ingrained my soul. And God, I, I need to go. We're not doing this on a 40-degree wash or a 30-degree wash. We're going to ramp it up to 60 degrees, right? And we're going to lose lots of detergent and vanish and so on. God, I need you to do a deep cleansing, washing work so the dirt is gone. I need you to cleanse me, God. So the, 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 the stuff that's unclean is removed from me so that I can enjoy fellowship with you. These things that David prays that God would take away. Do, do you notice the impact that sin has upon us? I mean, if you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ and, and you're not walking with Him as Lord and Savior, you're just here this morning or listening online because you kind of wanted to find out a little bit what church is like. If, if that's the case and if that's where you are, then this is what sin has done to you. It's, there's a stain on your soul. You're separated from God. You have a heart that is hard. Your mind is darkened and you're separated from the life that is in God, our Savior, that it's what the Bible says. It sounds pretty harsh, but it's true. But maybe, maybe you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, and you're seeking to walk with Him as your Savior, but you, you've been on sin's highway, and so you're in the season where you're, just, you're making really, really foolish decisions and behaving really foolishly. And here's the impact of sin. It, it doesn't change your legal standing before God, but it will leave a mark that needs cleansing, that needs blotting out, that needs cleaning. It will separate you from God. And David's saying, I need you, God, please take these things away from me. Remove my sin as far as the east is from the west. Though my sins are like scarlet, God, would you make them as white as snow? And then he pleads inwardly, and God, while you're doing this, kind of removing this from me, God, I need you to do something new in my heart. And maybe, maybe this part of David's prayer is born out of looking at King Saul and seeing the impact of sin in King Saul's life. 
You know, Saul was walking with God. He was anointed by God. He was king. Then he disobeyed God, and he refused to repent. And so what did God do? Removed his Holy Spirit from him. And David just saw how Saul's life spiraled out of control. And he's saying, no, 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 God, you need to do something. You need to renew a steadfast heart within me, God. You need to renew my spirit within me. God, please don't remove your Holy Spirit from me. It's an outward pleading. Take things away from me. It's an inward pleading. God, you need to do something in my heart. And it's full of expectancy. Right? He's realized he's pleading, and he's full of expectancy. I love the first, I think it's the first two verses that David, where David prays. It just You see the character of God. He turns to God and he talks about God being merciful, which means that God treats us in a way that we don't deserve to be treated. He talks about God, which is unfailing love. This is a word that we should by now be getting very, very familiar with when it's spoken about God. The the Hebrew word is hesed. It means great love, steadfast love, loving devotion, fruitful love, loving kindness, constant love. Say, God, you're merciful. God, you are unfailing love. God, you are great in your compassion. You have a big heart for broken people. God, I'm going to just throw myself on your mercy. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to throw myself. You're the only one that I can go to. Reminded me during the course of this week of the third verse of that great hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. It has the words, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to thy fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Isn't that great? David is saying, I, I've got this enormous sin problem. I've got this enormous stain of sin. I've got this enormous weight of guilt because of my sin. But the great thing is, I, I know God who is greater. I know God who is able to redeem. He's, God, you're unfailing love, so I can come to you. And God, even if I throw myself upon your mercy and you choose to do nothing about it, th- that's up to you. But I can go nowhere else but to be able to come to you. Doesn't it remind you of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? That moment that the prodigal son has, he's sitting in a pigsty, eating, wanting to eat the pods that he's supposed to be feeding to the pigs. And he, he has this m- moment of realization. He's like, ah, oh, man, what am I doing? My mistakes are nothing in comparison to the great compassionate heart that my father has. I've got an idea. I'm going to go back to my dad, and I'm just going to ask him to be a servant. The the thing that the prodigal son does, which I think is wrong, is he sets the bar too low. He's thinking, God's going to, my father's going to have me back as a servant. He doesn't realize how huge God, his father's heart is. And so when his father sees him coming, what does the father do? He runs to him, and he falls on him. And his son is probably saying, Dad, I just want to be a servant, even the lowest servant. And he's like, what are you, nuts? (laughs) You're a son. And he puts a ring on his finger and a new pair of trainers on his feet and a robe that covers all the mess and the filth of the past few months. Hey, let me ask you this morning. Do you approach God in the same way? When you need to be cleansed of sin, when you've transgressed, when your sins are before you, and you've had a busted moment, which is a beautiful moment because it opens you up to the grace of God encounter moment, do you boldly approach the throne of grace to find help in your time of need? Or do you say to yourself, do you know what, I'll figure it out by myself. I'll say enough sorries so that I've pronounced forgiveness over myself. I'll do enough good things to get God back on my side. I'll wait till the moment of guilt passes and, hey, tomorrow it it will all be good again. I remember sitting with a friend of mine. He had been through a divorce. His life was in a mess. I remember sitting with him, and I was a new Christian at the time. I knew nothing, really. And I just remember saying to him, hey, my friend, there's a way to get your life back on track, and his name is Jesus. He does great things for broken people like me, like you. Uh, why, why, didn't, you know, why didn't you put your trust in him? Something. It was probably a lot more worse than that, right? And he looked at me, and he said, I know, Stu, I know. But I need to sort myself out first. And inwardly, I looked at him, I was like, 
That's not the way it works. <laughs> You've got to come with all your mess, with all your brokenness, but with a heart that is expectant based upon not the good things you can do, but upon who God is. He is unfailing love. He is merciful. He is great in His compassion. And there is no sin that is too great that He cannot reach you in. Amen? And this is good news. This is why we have Romans 8 verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is why Romans 8 finishes that there is nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus if we have put our trust in Him. Boldly we come to the throne of grace in order to find help. Expectant hearts, but then the all-important part. David begins to make promises. And this is the important part because, you see, everything up until this point has been words. But David gets to the point, he says, God, I'm not just bringing you words. I'm not just saying stuff. God, I want to change. And, and it's in the promising path. This is kind of these vows made to God, these commitments made to God. This is where the rubber hits the road and the real transformation of life begins to take place. And so David has realized his sin. He's pleaded with God. He's expecting that God is going to forgive him. And then he says, right now, God, and this is how I'm going to change. I'm not going to run with the sinners anymore. I'm going to tell them about you. I'm going to tell them about your goodness. I'm going to tell them about your grace. I'm going to tell them about your mercy. I'm going to introduce them to you. I'm going to say to them, this is what my life was like. This is what I'm like now. This is what I expect to be in the future. But on this journey of life, God's grace has not been without effect to me. And then I'm going to praise God. I'm going to praise. Praise is the breath of a heart set free by God's grace, is it not? It is the natural response of a believer is to come before God in praise because He has been so gracious to us. He's been so merciful to us, so kind to us. And if we will go through these things, realize our sin, plead with God, outward, inward, right? If we're expecting that God will do something, removing our sin from us, and we make these vows, God, I'm going to, I'm going to be different. I'm going to, and, and if it's a real struggle, I'm going to make myself accountable to somebody to help me to be different. Do you know what it does? It just draws the heart of God toward you. It draws the heart of God toward you. I said this earlier on in the service as we were worshiping that God wanted to do a heart work in somebody this morning. This is where it begins. This realizing, this pleading, this expecting, this promising, right? This is what draws the grace of God towards our hearts to change us and make us different. But it needs, it needs all of these things. An honest realizing, I have sinned. A heartfelt pleading, please forgive me. A faithful expectancy, I know my Redeemer lives. An action-oriented change, I made clean, I will live differently. It's the kind of confession that, that draws the heart of God toward people who want to walk with Him. It's the kind of confession that I think needs to be renewed in, in the church. It's the kind of confession that, that moves horizontally and has great impact on our lives. But do you want to know something else? If you'll practice this confession horizontally, it will have a deep impact as well. I said on Thursday evening at a church meeting that one of the things that saddens me that you see in churches so often is that Christians are so good at building walls, but we're not that great at building bridges. And then we get behind our walls and we lob verses at one another and various other things at one another. And people break into all these little different camps and that sort of thing that they're, they're in. And it breaks the heart of God. Whereas what God calls us to be is bridge builders. Bridge builders. And if, and if we're going to be build bridges into the lives of other people, so often it begins here. It begins with confession. It begins with people do, do, doing a little bit of heart searching. And then going to your brother, going to your sister, and, and, and working these things through. Honest confession. Brother, sister, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Full stop. All right? I'm sorry. Full stop. Not I'm sorry, but you made me so mad. Not I'm sorry, but it's actually your fault. 
Not I'm sorry, but I mean, all you're doing then is you're just justifying your poor actions, right? I'm sorry, full stop. Then heartfelt pleading, please forgive me. You know, genuine confession that doesn't have a request for forgiveness is not a genuine confession. So, so please forgive me for my wrong. And, and then once you've asked that question, it's up to the other person what they decide to do. You, you can't then cajole them to forgive you. You need to let God do a work of grace in their lives. They may say no, but that's not on you. Right? They may say no, but that's not on you. That, that, that's on them. Your job is to say, I am sorry, please forgive me. And we do it with a sense of expectancy, not in the generosity of people's heart, but in the greatness of God who provides the grace to ordinary broken people to be forgiven. We pray that, that God would do a work of grace in the person that we've offended and hurt with our actions or our words or our attitudes or whatever the case may be, so that, so that they will come across the bridge. And do you know what? That may take time. That may take time because sometimes so, the hurts are so deep that a person will say, I accept your apology. I forgive you for the wrong that you've, you've done for me. But hey, listen, we're not friends on Facebook yet. I hold nothing against you, but we're not in relationship at the moment. There's a trust that needs to be rebuilt in the space. And then there's action-oriented change. We're not just saying words or speaking out words. We're, we're, we're deciding deep in our hearts. We're saying, do you know what? And I'm going to be different. I'm going to behave differently, treat people differently, whatever the case may be. Do you know what will happen there? If we practice confession in this way, do you know what will happen? It opens up the heart of the other person to the possibility of showing grace. And a bridge is built. Maybe it's a little rickety bridge to, be, to begin with, but a bridge is built. It's a beginning. It's better than a wall. It's a, it's a start. It's a move in the right direction. And you know what's even greater than that? The world is watching, looking at the church, wondering, are these really disciples of Jesus? As Jesus said, hey, listen, by this people will know that you are my disciples in the way that you love one another, love which is patient, love which is kind, love which is gentle, love which keeps no record of wrongs, love which doesn't delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. And the world will see a church that love one another and gracious towards one another, and they'll say, hey, do you know what? Can I be a part of that? Can I experience this grace? And we'll be better for it, and God will be glorified, and it's all good, right? Right? So we've got